Welcome to week five. We are going to cover biofilms this week. So I have the PowerPoint up here, as you can see. Um, let me just put it into a slideshow format. All right, I kind of moved that little box down there. All right, so basically a biofilm is a community of organisms attached to a solid surface. It doesn't have to be a living surface. It could be living or non-living, technically. Um, and it, again, it's sometimes more than one a lot of times to make up these communities. They will evolve over time, consisting of lots of species. And most importantly, because they are multiple organisms, they kind of cooperate and work together. All right, so here's the book definition. Um, I believe this just came right out of your textbook. So a biofilm is a primitive developmental biologic system, thus bio, um, in which spatial organization of the cells within the matrix optimizes the use of available nutritional resources. So they're gonna really work together to get the best out of the nutritional resources available to them. All right, the other part of that before I move on, I should say it should be the last sentence. The steady state can be radically altered by applying physical forces. So that's the key in trying to get rid of them. But there are two main types of biofilms. There's gonna be sessile and planktonic. Planktonic is gonna be the free floating. The sessile is gonna be the one that's anchored to a surface. So the examples of biofilms where you find biofilms, you're gonna find them a lot of places. Water pipes, ventilator systems, wine casks, um, and then they do cause serious different infections, especially like cystic fibrosis patients if they're on a ventilator, things like that. So the problems with biofilms are they are notoriously difficult to kind of get rid of, and as we know, they're really hard to treat, and just using normal antibiotics isn't going to get rid of it if they are there. So what we see for characteristics, um, Ignore the stars. I'm not sure why I had the stars there at one point. I had a plan in mind. I forgot my plan. But important characteristics of biofilms is that um, they have attachment efficiencies. They have nutritional resources. They can try to withstand as much as possible mechanical factors and shear force. Um, they're all that kind of thing. And they have a cyclical stage of biofilm. So here's kind of what the properties of a biofilm look like texture roughness hydrophobicity um, conditioning film the properties of the surrounding fluid we need to take into account the flow velocity ph temperature cations that kind of thing and the properties of the cell this is just informational on this slide i wouldn't worry about this slide here now you definitely do need to know the stages in forming that biofilm so stage one otherwise known as development one, is going to be the attachment. See, I have that word bolded. So this is where we will have the attachment to a surface. Stage two, or development two, is the irreversible binding at this point. So now we have really bound it to that surface to the point where it can't move away. They're not going to have motility more. They're there. And that's where they're going to start to have the exopolysaccharide layer trap nutrients in there and then extra free-floating bacteria into it. Stage three, otherwise known as maturation one, is now we're gonna layer up. We're gonna build that biofilm community up. Stage four, maturation two, the thickness is gonna be greater than 100 micrometers at this point. We've really built it up. And stage five is going to be possible dispersion, meaning there is a possibility that some bacteria can break off and start a new biofilm elsewhere or become a plectonic biofilm, which means free floating. So as you go through the stages, you're going to see the initial attachment, the reversible binding and exopolysaccharide layering, um, the thickening up, and then finally it'll continue to live and thrive, but some may disperse or break off from that. So those are the five stages to know. Another term that's important to know is persister cells. These are basically organisms or cells, whatever you want to say, that persist, that can survive. Um, they survive sometimes in a dormancy-like state. They are not really affected by drugs, um, antibiotics, anything like that. They, that's why they're called persisters. They just persist. So I'll show you something on that here at the end of the PowerPoint. 
the talks further about that term. All right, again, the makeup of the biofilms, we have our different layers that I do want you familiar with. The outer layer is going to be kind of the active, metabolically active cells. The intermediate, not as active, um, and they kind of have the reservoir for genes for nutrient using and drug resistance in that intermediate layer. And then the inside is going to be those persister cells. Um, they're kind of lying dormant there, but they're always persisting and resistant. So this whole community, again, defends itself as a group. It will freely kind of exchange genetic traits to kind of help mutate and resist everything as much as it can. So the component of the biofilm is broken down here. Water is up to 97% of it. And then you have your microbial cells. So again, when we're saying cells, we're meaning the organisms, the bacterial cells, if you will. And again, we have the exopolysaccharide layer that helps seal it all in, that kind of thing. All right. So as far as other properties, the ability to have pathogenicity and disease, this is another box that comes right out of your textbook. So a biofilm, again, allows attachment to a surface. Um, they use the nutrients and metabolic efficiency of the community to the, its advantage. They have great host defense to evade, um, I should say they evade host defenses like phagocytosis, that kind of thing. So this whole thing is just a listing of how great they are at becoming resistant to drugs, not being, you know, eaten up or by phagocytes, um, and maintaining their stability, their living in that community. All right. At the initial attachment, the bacterial adhesions uh, will use surface proteins, pili, and motility as this goes. As the biofilm matures, they're going to kind of suppress that adhesion and motility because they're already, you know, attached. They're already established. They don't need to use that as much anymore after the initial attachment. The benefits of the biofilm properties, again, it's living in a nutrient-rich environment that exopolysaccharide, which is EPS, helps trap further organisms in there and then also helps get glucose to them. They love that them some glucose, that energy, just like our cells do. Um, and then it helps withstand any changes to the environment, any changes to pH and other values. So when culturing organisms, you can see this biofilms potentially in catheter tips, artificial joints, anything that's like a prosthetic medical device, it could be on there and living. Um, Isolation of individual organisms out of the biofilm are very hard to culture. Usually it's just a community. You're not going to be able to identify single organisms out of that community. Um, that's for the sessile ones that are attached to the surface. As far as the planktonic free floating, um, th again, they're not attached to the surface, so they're not really representing anything attached there. They're more free floating. So now down to here, isolated colonies may not contain antibiotic resistance, but other colonies in the group may contain. It's kind of an interesting um, thing in that in that community, remember, it's multiple organisms making up the biofilm. Not every single organism in there is resistant to the same antibiotic. Some have resistance to this antibiotic, some have resistance to that. If you treat it with a certain antibiotic and there's some organisms in there that are resistant, it can make the whole, um, it helps protect the whole biofilm. But it may look susceptible in a dish depending on what you picked up in the culture. So it may look like, oh, this or drug will work on the, you know, infection because it looks susceptible when they do it up in the lab. But because it's a whole community in there, not just single organisms, you won't, it won't work when you go to treat it. It will be a treatment failure. All right, again, as we've said before, biofilm also lets it protect against any pH changes. It helps with preventing phagocytosis, any antibody antigen kind of binding, um, that kind of thing. So all of it is there to just help it survive, which is what it ultimately wants to do. All right, the other big thing with it is, is how it gets resistant and mutates. And that's because if it's all living together in a close-knit little family, they can easily do gene transfer. And they can do that through usually transformation or conjugation. So it's a great way for them to mutate and change and adapt and survive. So that's why there's greater genetic potential as a group than them alone on their own. Now, again, desegregation at the bottom there is the potential to transmit 
resistant aggregates of microorganisms to other body sites. So they can kind of just chunk off and go to another body site, if you will. So big ones again were indwelling medical devices, so artificial heart valves, prostheses, catheters, um, but you can also see it within tissues and vessels like on a vessel wall lining itself. So, all right, so there's kind of a listing of human infections that involve biofilms just kind of informational and different organisms that we know that are typically involved within that biofilm as well. So this is just informational. It's impossible for you to memorize. Well, it's not impossible, but I'm not going to make you memorize this whole list. All right. The big one, though, that you should always know about is dental biofilm. So we always hear the term plaque at our dentist. Um, that's when the little hygienist loves to scrape your teeth for plaque. That's a dental biofilm. Um, it causes cavities, which we know as caries, and periodontal disease. So that's why you have to go every six months is how to get rid of all the plaque. I mean, of course, you should be brushing your teeth, flossing, all those steps they tell you to do to help keep it cleansed. But every six months, it really thoroughly cleans it off because out, over time, the biofilm develops again. And that's kind of that slimy layer. If you haven't brushed your teeth in a while, you kind of know they feel, they feel carpety gross. I always think they feel carpety. Is that a weird term? Maybe it is. But... You get the idea. The other big thing that leads to like cavities is you get sugars that sit on there, break down to acids, which eat through the teeth. You get the idea. I'm not a dentist, but I always want to make sure that people understand plaque is a biofilm, really is what it is. So, and it's something you can relate to. We all have heard and know what plaque is. Um, gingivitis is when plaque accumulates and lets sit there and kind of leads to that inflammation and infection. The big pathogens that are involved with dental stuff is a lot of times it is anaerobic. Um, and there are some nasty little anaerobes that can exist and cause severe periodontitis and gingivitis. So they're kind of listed there in the pathogens down below and you can see some of the anaerobes listed and then there's a couple other things. As far as cystic fibrosis patients, definitely can lead to a chronic lung infection due to biofilms. Again, I have spoke of, you should always think of Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Burkholderia sapacea as two very significant organisms that cause problems, lung infections in cystic fibrosis patients. So here it talks through Pseudomonas aeruginosa, originally existing as a free-floating planktonic bacteria, but it can later form a biofilm, especially since cystic fibrosis patients have that thick mucus. Um, it uses that to help produce a slime layer and make its environment, its little community started. Same with Burkholderia sapacea. So again, treatment is going to be really difficult because a single antibiotic won't always really work here since it's going to be a community of starting. And then other ventilator-associated pneumonias are becoming very big concern, especially in um, ICUs. That has been something that's rising in concern, and, and um, it takes a lot to um, help get rid of the infections and because it's a biofilm kind of state. All right, so there are lots of different microbes that are commonly associated with those medical devices. So there are devices you can see on. Um, these are all big, bad pathogens. We've talked through these and different things. But note the coagnate staph here. The one you should be thinking of is staph epidermidus. You know, we've always talked about how staph epidermidis is normal flora, it's usually contaminants in the lab, except with medical device infections, which is what you guys have all learned. And that's because staph epidermidis is amazing at creating a polysaccharide layer, which is what a biofilm layer is. So because it can create that whole exopolysaccharide layer to it, it helps create the community to hang on to those medical devices. And you can see the list that it's responsible with is a big one. So that kind of is nice link to talking back to that staff epi. All right, cultures. It's hard to culture them. It's hard to get the colonies. I mean, because it's a community of colonies. So, and they don't always want to grow normally. Um, so a lot of times you might see a false negative because they're just not going to grow the right way. Um, so you might think that there's nothing there when it really is. So, and again, when you do get colonies to grow, they can re represent up to 100,000 mixed bacteria, not just one type. So, all your lab testing, your susceptibility testing isn't going to be really accurate. So, the best way, 
like everything else in microbiology is going to molecular PCR testing is great. Um, so there's also this confocal laser scanning microscopic imaging as well, which basically visibly sees the biofilm in existence. So that's the best way to detect and determine. And everything seems to be going to molecular anyway. So in the, I think it's at the University of Montana or Montana State University, a school in Montana has an entire, I think it's an amazing website dedicated to biofilm and biofilm engineering. I listed the link there um, and I pulled it up here. So I wanted to show you Montana State University. That's They have a center for biofilm engineering. Who knew, right? Um, so I pulled up a page off of this because I always think it's really helpful especially because it'll have pictures um, and different explanations of the stages. It's the section one, what are biofilms, where do they grow, how do they impact, or the key characteristics. So if you're interested, you can look through more of this. Um, down here is like a little image they put together. Uh, and they showed the little biofilm growth pattern in action, how it starts from individual bacteria and builds itself up to a whole colony, that kind of thing. Um, they also have a poster picture representation here as a PDF that you can pull up. I just wanted to click one thing here. Um, so they have on that last step differentiation, they have a whole thing on persister cells. So the cells may turn into persisters. So persister is a hypothetical cell state which microorganisms are protected from all types of antimicrobial insults. Again, they are able to persist. They're able to hang out and not be hurt over time. So it's just a little information on that term, if you will. Of course, on my quizzes, I don't get that in depth, but I thought it was very interesting, so I wanted to share. So I'm going to go back to the page I originally was at. Um, the other thing that people don't realize is, you know, we talked a little bit about where you see biofilm with medical devices and stuff, but your home, lots of it. Like we said, water pipes at one point there is a huge buildup in your water pipe there of a biofilm. Another big one, and I always talk about this, this is why I, I don't use sponges. Now, I know people wash their sponges, but a lot of people don't, which I find really gross, um, because I at least wash my wash like dishcloths in really, really hot water, but sponges, kitchen sponges are notorious establishers of biofilms. Um, and it's just saying, given the combination of lots of surface area for attachment, water, and plenty of organic material, food, basically, it makes it the ideal area. So if you don't clean your kitchen sponges, there you go. <laughs> Pacifiers, like, now you guys, I mean, I don't want to gross you out thoroughly, but I, it's interesting. It really, really is interesting. Um, this is the close-up of the kitchen sponge biofilm, that slime there. Look at that. Yummy. All right, so you get the idea. Uh, I will stop. I will be done now. So that is the chapter this week. I will see you guys all later on. Have a fabulous week.